Welcome to the YouTube channel for Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. My name is Russell Dixon and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor here. You know, the only way we can bring messages like the one you're about to watch, both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast is through the generosity of not only our church family, but also of you, our extended family. So if you would like to contribute to help support the work that God is doing through this ministry financially, you can go to our website at sunsetcanyonchurch.org and simply click on the button that says give. We hope that this week's message encourages you to seek Jesus, and we pray that it helps you to grow in your walk with Him. Now, here's this week's message. As many of you know, we've been in a series called Blind Spots, and today I have asked my good friend Scott Kadersha to come and speak on blind spots in marriage. And before I ask uh, Scott to come up and share the word, I'd just share with you the history of uh, my connection with Scott. So when I first moved into married ministry at Second Baptist in Houston, uh, this guy that has done a few things in married ministry named Gary Thomas has wrote a few, written a few books about marriage. Um, he's kind of one of the more well-known guys in the country. Uh, he told me, he said, hey, you need to reach out to my friend Scott because he is, Scott at the time and his wife Kristen were serving at Watermark Community Church in Dallas. And really a lot of the programs, Scott will never uh, brag on himself, but I have the mic, so I'll brag on him. Um, a lot of the programs that Watermark has started for marriage ministry have really been used throughout the country. And so Scott and I just began a remote friendship uh, over the years. And honestly, I had not met Scott in person until this weekend. But we uh, have continued to stay in touch and have just been good friends. Uh, they, over the last two years, were called and moved to Harris Creek Church in Waco, Texas. Um, it is one of the fastest growing churches in the entire country. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law serve there. They are involved in Scott's ministry. And so uh, y'all pray for especially my sister. My brother-in-law is a saint. And so not so much prayers for him. We've said in my family, if, if everybody's got to go, Liz and Clark Griswold, aka Grizz, are the ones that stay. So they're good there, but we can pray for my sister. But uh, uh, Scott and Kristen are just amazing, godly people. They have four amazing sons. So you are clearly gonna be an expert on marriage if you raise four boys. Can I get an amen? So uh, church family, it's my privilege to introduce to you my great friend, Scott Kadersha. So kind. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you throw that picture up of my family just to show you a picture of them? There they are. All right, so that's my, uh, my wife, Kristen. And we, uh, we've been married 21 years. And uh, it's really funny, a few days ago, we, we taught together in our marriage class. And we got up on stage and we're introducing our families. And we look up at the picture. We were wearing the exact same clothes, <laughs> teaching that we were wearing on the picture. So I was very intentional to wear something different today. So this is my wife, Kristen. She's up here in the front row, 21 years of marriage. Uh, we got married the week of 9-11. So that was a Tuesday. We got married a couple days after that, and so just celebrated 21 in the fall. Sometimes I like to say we celebrated 252 months of marriage, just as a fun way to talk about it. And so we're, we're you know, we're loving life as a married couple. You can put that picture back up. Four sons, and so uh, twins, and so they are both on uh, this side of the picture. So Drew is all the way on the outside. He's our musical, creative, really bright. He is a freshman at Belmont University in Nashville. His twin brother, they look nothing alike. It's hard to imagine they're brothers, let alone twins. But his twin brother, Duncan, uh, is a freshman at Baylor University. Any bears in the house? Sick them. Let's go. Uh, and then on the other side of my wife is Carson. He is 16, uh, sophomore in high school. 90% of the reason why I'm bald and gray and just a, just a <laughs> but a really sweet, passionate young man. And then our baby, quote unquote baby, is Lincoln. He is 14. He's now the biggest in the family. Uh, he is in eighth grade. And so, it, it, you know, it's a really loud, obnoxious, stinky, smelly house. Uh, 
that was before we added the boys. And so you can imagine what it's, what it's like now. So, uh, so we've been married 21 years, done marriage ministry for, I think, 17 years full time. And so just been around a lot of couples and, and gotten to work with pre-married and newlyweds and empty nesters and everything in between. And I love getting to speak on marriage. It's also really fun to get to visit somewhere else. And so just to, you know, as Miss Beverly shared her testimony of, by, you know, by faith through grace in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and just to be with the larger body of Christ and see that we worship the same God, the same uh, King Jesus in Dripping Springs and Waco and Dallas and all over the world. And so it's an encouragement to get to be here with you this morning. We're continuing this series, Blind Spots, and specifically we're going to talk about blind spots in marriage. But before we do, uh, if you, you know, either if you are married or you know someone who's married or you've been married previously, you know that we come into marriage and all relationships really with expectations. There are certain things that we expect. There, there are even things that you expect about Sunday mornings here. You expect how long it's going to take you to park and where you're going to park. And you expect that there's going to be coffee in the lobby. And you might expect, you know, I'm going to be able to sit in this seat or park in this spot, and I'm going to wear this, uh, this shirt. You might expect different things. You might have expected Pastor Russell to be up here. We have expectations about everything. We really have expectations about relationships, and especially about marriage. So where do we get, uh, I love to interact and just, you know, kind of talk back and forth. Where do we get expectations uh, for marriage? Where do they come from? Parents, yeah, good. What else? TV, yeah, where else? Books, social media, where else? Church, yeah, I hope so, right? Where else? Parents, friends, yep, all of those. You got all of them, all the ones I'm thinking about. Social media, TV, culture in general. I mean, you know, so sometimes we very rarely get good expectations or real, real, realistic expectations there. The other side of the spectrum ought to be God's word and the body of Christ of what to expect in marriage. Our parents are probably the biggest influence on us and what we believe about marriage. And some of you maybe grew up in homes where mom and dad were never married. Some of you were in a home where mom and dad got divorced when you were really young. Some of you grew up in a single parent family home. Some of you grew up in a home where mom and dad have amazing marriages. But that's probably the biggest source of expectations. And so when we got married in 2001, Kristen expected a few things of me. Her dad, you see, is like unbelievable around the house. He can fix anything. If there's a hole in the drywall, he can fix it. If there's a picture that needs to go on the wall, he can put it, put it up. If there's a problem with the water heater, he knows how to replace it and get another one and put it in there. If there's a problem with the car, he can change the oil. He can fix it. He can diagnose the problem. If there's a problem with the lawnmower, he can fix it. Okay, so Kristen expected maybe Scott would be able to do some of these things. I can change light bulbs. Okay, I can use a stud finder and find a stud on the wall, and I can grill. Okay, and that's about the, the, uh, the extent of what I'm able to do around the home. And, and so just some unmet expectations there. And the reality is these unmet expectations that we all have about marriage often lead to problems. They lead to blind spots. And so as we continue this series of, called Blind Spots, I want to talk about three specific obstacles or problems in marriage that lead couples to drift. That maybe we expected marriage to be really incredible before we said, I do, but then we realize that it's really different and things aren't exactly what we expect. And so I'm going to preach specifically on three blind spots that cause problems in marriage that lead us to drift away from what we expected and from the ideal. And so Pastor Russell has defined blind spots. A few weeks ago, I heard this. He said, it's an area in which a person lacks understanding, or an area where a person's view is obstructed. And so we have, uh, we've taught several boys how to, how to drive a car, and so we're very familiar with the blind spot. It's that spot when you're trying to turn that you can't see properly. And so there are some things in marriage that we just can't see properly. And if we don't address these blind spots, we're going, like you would with a car, you're going to crash. If you don't address these blind spots in marriage, your marriage is going to fail, or maybe you'll stay married, but you're just going to be miserable together. And my heart is not just that you would stay married until death do you part. That's a great goal. I want you to thrive in your marriage. 
I don't want you just to coexist. If you are somebody who's a young adult or you know, in high school or middle school and you're not married yet, this is the dream that I hope for you, is that you would love Jesus, and if you get married, that you would thrive in marriage till death do you part. I don't want you just to coexist as roommates and be miserable together. And so this is a really important discussion for us to think through what are the blind spots that cause us to crash, to have problems in marriage, to merely coexist and not experience life to the full. Now, a couple caveats. If you are married, this is obviously going to apply for, to you. If you are single, you, know, you might say, what does a message on marriage have to do with me? I want you to know that either if you're single and hope to get married, regardless, you know people who are married. And a lot of what I share today applies to you, whether you are single, married, single again. And so nobody could clap out of this message. This is not just for married people, and then really anytime we open up God's word, we can learn from it. The other thing I want you to know, typically I will open up a passage in the Bible and teach through it, one chunk of scripture and teach through it exegetically. I'm not doing that this morning. I'm gonna jump around a little bit to three specific passages that address the biggest blind spots that I see. And so we're gonna address those three blind spots and then talk about how you can restore your vision so you can see properly, so those, those blind spots don't lead you to crash in your marriage. The first blind spot we're going to talk through is the blind spot of unrealistic expectations. So does anyone know there, there's only one promise in the Bible, cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, one promise about marriage. Does anyone know what that is? If you know it, it's so, like, just shout it out. Okay, you're good, good to, most people don't know this. Okay, the only promise about marriage in the Bible. Okay, it's not that you're gonna have amazing kids. It's not that, that intimacy is gonna be incredible. It's not that you're gonna be happy till death do you part. The only promise about marriage, cover to cover, is that if you marry, you will have trouble. Amen, right? If you have been married for a minute or you've seen married couples, or if you've been married for decades, you can say amen. It's either gonna make you say amen or ouch, right? So if you marry, you will have trouble. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 27 and 28. This is in the middle of a passage about singleness and marriage and divorce and remarriage, and he says this. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. So if you're married, don't seek to be released from it. He says, are you free from such a commitment? If so, do not look for a wife. And that's a conversation for another day. But if you're, you know, <laughs> next verse, verse 28. If you do marry, you have not sinned, which is a really good thing. Okay, if you have married, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. And then here, here's what the point I mentioned a minute ago. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. And so in marriage, it is guaranteed that you are going to have and that's really all of life, right? Another verse I was thinking of is Luke chapter six, verse 47 through 49. It's Jesus telling the parable of the wise builder. And he talks about one person who builds their home on rock and one who builds their home on sand. And the storms and the trials come. This is the one thing that's very similar to the wise builder and the foolish builder. Okay, one builds on a really good foundation. They dug down deep and build their life on the solid rock foundation of Jesus. The other one built on a really faulty foundation. But the one thing that's similar between these two is that the storms come. The winds come, the rains fall, and they will come against your house. And so whether you built your house on rock or on sand, you are going to face trials. It is the one thing that is guaranteed for singles. It's the one thing that's guaranteed for married couples. And so we've got to be ready for those. We've got to expect that the challenges are going to come so that when they do come, your house does not wash away like the one on sand, but stand strong on the solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ. And so those troubles are going to come in a few different ways. You are either going to bring those troubles on yourself. You're going to look at pornography. You're going to cheat on your spouse. You're going to lie. You're going to lead a secret double life. Sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes you are the spouse who is married to somebody who does that. Trials are going to come. Sometimes it's something you both do together that brings them on. Sometimes they have absolutely nothing to do with you. It's not your fault at all. Okay, some of you are going to work through, walk through infertility in marriage. You're not going to be able to get pregnant. That is not your fault. Some of you are going to be abused or the victim of a crime. It's not your fault but we know the challenges and the trials are going to come. 
But yet, in those unmet expectations, the, the problem and the blind spot of unrealistic expectations, for some reason, we all pretend like we've got all of our stuff together. We pretend the problems aren't there. We, you know, it's, it's Sunday, you know, feeling blessed, never stressed, got that sunshine on my Sunday best, right? Like we want to look really good and we want everyone to think that we've got our stuff together. And so, you know, how's your marriage? It's great. How's married life? Oh, it's awesome. Living the dream. Everything's amazing in marriage, but behind closed doors, things are really, really tough. And so for some reason, we just don't feel the freedom to be real and to be honest about what marriage is really like especially within the body of Christ. Okay, we've got to be real and to be honest. And so we put on the face, we pretend everything's great, but at home, we're really struggling. And I don't know why that's the case, because we know that we're all going to face troubles. It's guaranteed, but yet we pretend like we've got it all together. And so I want us to be authentic within the body of Christ. Author Paul Tripp says that marriage is, is a sinner married to another sinner, in a broken, fallen world. But yet sometimes we just pretend like we have to have it all together, like we've got our stuff perfect and there are no problems in our marriage. And so I want us to be real, to be authentic, because there's a humility that comes when we're weak and we admit that maybe things aren't working out like we thought that they would. And so we live like fake Christians in a world and pretend like we've got it all together. Uh, my dad uh, my dad passed away when I was six years old. My mom remarried a few years later. My mom and my stepdad were married for 33 years until he passed away a few years ago, complications from Alzheimer's. But my stepdad was a sporting goods representative. And so in his job, he was like the middleman between a sporting goods manufacturer and then the stores that sell the sporting goods. So like he would work with Nike and Reebok and Under Armour and then a sporting goods store like Dick's Sporting Goods, Academy, anywhere that, you know, Target even, anywhere that sells sporting goods, my dad would work between these two. And so he would, uh, you know, he would find out about the new product and he'd go, hey, you know, Dick's Sporting Goods, what was that the big, what's the big sporting goods store here? Academy, right? He'd go, hey, Academy, there's this great new product, this great new shoe that Nike has. You want to get it and put it on your shelf. There's this new kind of basketball that you can use. There's this new kind of kayak that you can use outside. Like he would work between the companies and the stores. And every, you know, every year, like a couple times a year, all of them would come together in a big convention center. And so like, uh, you know, Dallas Convention Center, Chicago Convention Center, all of these sporting goods manufacturers would come together along with the purchasers and this was like the big event for my dad. And so he would go to these events. He would represent both sides. He'd find out about the new products. What I loved about these shows is that each sporting good manufacturer would always bring the biggest and greatest athletes that they had representing their stuff. And so like, you know, back in the day, Nike is there with all their stuff. And who do they have at the booth? Michael Jordan right? If it's today, it's, uh, it's um, LeBron James. And he had a big week, right? He's still not the GOAT. There's not even close. It's always Michael. We know that. And so like, you know, <laughs> so, you know, Nike's there with Michael Jordan and, you know, uh, this modern, you know, modern day would be like LeBron or Steph Curry would be there with Under Armour. And so what I loved is my dad would go to these shows and he would come home with a stack of autographs for me. Like, I thought he was the greatest stepdad in the history of the world. Over the years, I had this massive collection of autographs. And, and the cool thing is they weren't just like signed pieces of paper. They were actually written to me. And so would, you know, say, hey, Scott, good luck in your baseball game. I was a first baseman. Hey, I'm a first baseman too, and good luck in your game this week. And, you know, hey, go get them. Go beat the Giants or the Yankees or the Tigers, all these things that would say on there. And I collected all of these, and I put them in, for lack of a better word, they went in a scrapbook. And so over the years, I'm collecting all these and, you know, and then fast forward now to a few years ago, and I've been in ministry for a full time and, you know, for a long time. And I, I, I do find like, you know, I don't make a ton of money, but there's, there's food on the table and cars in the garage and clothes on our back. But I'm thinking through how are we going to send four children to college? Okay. And they're, they're extremely ordinary and average children. Okay. Like unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> They've heard me say this. So if they were in the room, they would agree. They love Jesus, which is extraordinary, but no college is giving a scholarship out to people who love Jesus. Okay? There, there's no 
college athletes. There's no like famous musicians, anything like that. And so we're just trying to think through like, what's the side hustle? What are we going to do? How do we put four kids through college without going into an enormous amount of debt? And so one day I have this bright idea. Let's go find those autographs and let's go sell them. Some of them are, are for people who, you know, have passed away, people who are Hall of Famers, the best in the world. In fact, I brought you a picture of one of them. It's from Pete Rose. Okay, don't think Pete Rose after all the scandals and all that, but Pete Rose was the greatest hitter of all time probably. Is that, is that fair? So he set all kinds of records with hitting, and, and Pete Rose wrote me this note, and he grabbed this thing from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and so kind. He went from, you know, Philadelphia to Chicago and brought this just for me and writes a note and says, Scott, I, I was thinking of you. I thought you would enjoy this. And so I've got all these autographs, and I'm thinking we could sell these, put our kids through college. Well, I start looking through the scrapbook, and I'm like, it's kind of interesting. All the P's look the same, and all the R's look the same, and it doesn't matter how old they are. It doesn't matter if they're male or female. It doesn't matter if they play hockey or tennis or boxing or baseball but they all start looking the same. And so I get on the phone. I call my younger brother, Chris. Chris is a, a cop in New Jersey, and he's got this really thick New York, New Jersey accent. And I go, hey, Chris, I was looking through the autographs, and like, do you think, Dad, do you think he faked them? And he starts laughing, and he goes, you knucklehead. You thought those was real? Every single one of them was a fraud. And... Uh, <laughs> And so in that moment, I realized, and then he starts laughing, he calls my mom, and my mom starts laughing. Everyone knew they were fake except for me. And so I have an amazing scrapbook of pictures of athletes and boxers and tennis players, all signed by my stepdad. And so it's, it's honestly extremely uh, valueless and worthless. Okay, so Apparently, my kids aren't going to college, and they're all starving since we can't send them and get all the things I thought we would get from them. So I tell you, I tell you all that because, because like, if those things were real, they'd be worth something. But because they're fake, they lack value. And we do the same in marriage. If we're real, it's valuable. It's authentic. It's worth something. But when we're, we're fake, when we're inauthentic, we're not living the truth. We're living a lie. And I want us to be real and to be authentic, just to be willing to say, hey, sometimes I'm a fraud. I'm a fraud, as my brother would say. Sometimes it's not realistic. We need to be able to say, here's what it's really like. Okay, this is a blind spot we miss because we are inauthentic and we need to be people who are real. We're the body of Christ. And so what would it look like for us, instead of being inauthentic and being fake, to admit when we fall short. And so the solution to fix the blind spot is to be real, to communicate, to be aware of our expectations. I went way long on number one. And so the first blind spot that leads us to drift is unrealistic expectations. The second blind spot is sin and selfishness. The blind spot of sin and selfishness, this is not the time for you to elbow your significant other, to blame and to think, I'm so glad they're here listening to this message. Okay, this is the time for you to realize how badly your sin and selfishness affects your marriage. Okay, the book of James, James 4, verse 1. James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? And so the reason why we fight, the reason why we have a blind spot in marriage, the reason why we drift a way towards oneness and strength in marriage is because we don't deal with our selfishness and with our sin. And this is every single one of us struggles with this. And so again, it's really easy to spot the selfishness in our spouse. If only my spouse did this, or if only they did that, our marriage would be better. And this might manifest itself in marriage in one of many different ways. But it said we don't have money and we spend it on excess in ways that we want to spend it, knowing that it's going to cause problems in our marriage. We eat to excess what we want to eat, when we want to eat it, even though we know that we have problems with our weight and health. It's drinking to excess when we want to drink, knowing that it caused problems in our marriage. It's not caring about others in the way that we communicate, that we interrupt them and we just want to make sure that our point is heard. It's selfishness. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion or her opinion. It's Proverbs 18, 2. 
And so we're selfish in the way that we communicate. We're selfish because we look at porn instead of pursuing our spouse. We're selfish because we're entitled. We're selfish when we have babies, when we wake up in the middle of the night and you hear the baby crying and you pretend that you're asleep. Okay, if you have kids, you've done it, all right? And your spouse leans over and they ask you if you're awake and you start breathing a little heavier. You, you are selfish and you know it. And so every single one of us, and so that verse, James 4.1 what causes fights, what causes quarrels among you, is it not this? It's selfish desires that battle within you. And so this idea, that word desires, means it's a selfish passion that comes out. And it's really easy to blame our problems on our spouse. But when we, we realize how selfish we are, it's a blind spot when we just blame instead of taking responsibility for our sin and our selfishness. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15 that he is the chief sinner. And I remember reading that verse and realizing in that moment that, that I am the chief sinner in our marriage, that I'm the chief problem in our marriage. It's not Kristen's problems. It's not Kristen's people-pleasing or Kristen's, you know, she's, very, she's a very much a, a, a Enneagram 9. If you're, she's a people-pleaser. She likes to keep peace in the home. And so I'll blame things on her at times when it's absolutely not her fault. The problems in our marriage come from me. Okay, and and if, she, if I take that mentality that I'm the biggest problem and she would take the mentality that she's the biggest problem, that allows us to have a marriage that thrives. When we both decide to draw a circle around ourselves, work on everyone inside the circle, instead of blaming our significant other. And so the second big blind spot is sin and selfishness. And it's a problem that every one of us has because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. And so we are all sinners. And so I wanna challenge you to think through not how your spouse is selfish. And again, this is so helpful if you are single, thinking through like, how am I selfish and how is my selfishness affecting my relationships? Just like the blind spot of selfishness will tank a marriage, the sin of selfishness in relationships with roommates or classmates or coworkers will tank those relationships as well. And so what does it look like for us to own the fact that we are sinners and we're selfish and we've got to deal with that problem? It causes problems in marriage and it causes problems in all relationships. We're really good at seeing it in others, but not good at seeing it in ourselves. And so what do we do about our selfishness? Fortunately, we get the greatest solution to selfishness in the history of the world. We get to look to the example of Jesus Christ, right? who even though he was God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of, of a servant, taking on our sin upon himself. And he went and died on the cross for our sins. And so while you and I don't need to die on the cross for our sins, it is finished, it is paid, we are to live in the same way that Jesus lived. We are to put the needs and desires of others before our own. And so if you wanna learn how to deal with the blind spot of sin and selfishness in marriage, in relationships, you look to the example of Jesus Christ who was and is the epitome of selflessness. And so the first blind spot is unrealistic expectations. The solution is to communicate about them, be aware of them. The second is the, sin of, uh, the, the blind spot of sin and selfishness. Look to the example of Christ. The third blind spot this morning is the blind spot of boredom and complacency. Boredom and complacency. So uh, Kristen, I didn't share this part of my story in the beginning, uh, but Kristen was actually my teacher. When I was in grad school, I'm a physical therapist by training. And, and so in uh, PT school, uh, you had, any PTs in the room? Okay, that's a problem. If anyone has aches or pains, you're missing out because it's a great profession. And so, uh, so I was in PT school. Kristen's a few years older than me and uh, wiser, more mature. She is a physical therapist in this clinic. And I show up, you've got to do these uh, two-month rotations in the school I was at to become a physical therapist. And so there's a lot of classroom work the first two years, and then the last year is a lot of clinical rotations, and I, I show up for my first clinical rotation, and so it's this place called Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia. I go up to the second floor of the Shepherd Center, and I sit down on this mat 
a blue mat there in the gym and you know that somebody says hey go sit there your instructor's coming and so in walks this woman who's five foot eleven and a half and brown hair she's got blue eyes with yellow streaks around them drop dead beautiful and she comes up to me and she says hey I'm going to be your instructor the next two months and uh, I wasn't a Christian at the time but I, I think I still said thank you God because I had like it was it was love at first sight for, for one of us. The other one just had first sight. And so, uh, so I, I was like, this girl is amazing. I want to, I'd like, you know, I, I can't wait. She's going to be my teacher. And you know, I'm going to do a really good job on this rotation. I'm going to crush it over the next couple months. And so finally, you know, not, not while I was her student, I finished up school, came back and got a job working there. Maybe partly because she worked there. I don't know. I don't know if that was part of it or not. But I go take a job at this hospital. We start up a friendship. We're both followers of Christ now. And, uh, and I just studied Kristen like crazy. Like I studied hard in grad school. I really, I got my master's in physical therapy. I got a PhD in studying Kristen. <laughs> like I was going to do whatever she wanted to do. And so Kristen liked to run. And so I'm not quite the running type, but, but for a few months, a few years, I became a runner. Like, do you like to run? Okay, sure, I'll, I'll go learn how to run. And so we would run together. She said she likes sushi. Like, okay, raw fish surrounded by seaweed and rice, I'm in. Count me in for that. Okay, coffee, you like drinking coffee and lattes? Sure, I'll have brown, dirty water that's bitter. And, you know, and so started to drink coffee. All these things, because Kristen liked them, I liked them. Now I, I actually love most of those things. I don't love running. I love sushi and I love coffee. So pardon me because of Kristen. And so I just studied her like crazy. Can we, we tend to do that before we get married. Okay, when we're trying to impress the other person, we want to know everything about them. We want to know what they like, what they don't like. We want to do the things that they want to do. We do whatever it takes so that we can impress them so that they will go out with us, so that they will marry us. I have seen this pattern literally thousands and thousands of time over the last 18 years in ministry. Okay, over and over and over. Super creative, like fun date nights and pursue them and put their needs first and, and all of this crazy so that they like us and they marry us. And then we get married and we become really boring. We stop pursuing them. We stop caring. We stop asking questions. We stop doing the things that they want to do. It's like, I've already won her over. I don't need to do those anymore. I'm just going to do what I want to do. Or I know what Kristen was like in 1998. I've already asked her all the questions, and you know, I already got her to say yes to me in 2001, and so I don't need to pursue her anymore. So we just coexist. We just sit as bored married couples. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of seeing couples just coexist and go, well, we're not going to get divorced. We're just going to ride it out until we die, until one of us dies. And, but it's like the most miserable relationship, but we're not going to get divorced or we're going to get divorced and just be miserable. You think that's the solution? It's such a problem, the blind spot of boredom and complacency. Dave Carter is a writer, a researcher. He says one of the biggest causes of infidelity in marriage is boredom. We get bored and we get stuck, and so we look for fun outside of marriage. It's never okay to do that, but boredom often leads to that. And so the third blind spot we've got to be aware of, we've got to deal with, is, is the blind spot uh, of, uh, of boredom and complacency. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 7, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. And let, let me just hit pause on that really quick. That doesn't mean it says husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives. That doesn't mean husbands, you've got multiple wives. Okay, speaking collectively, this is not a proof text that polygamy is okay. It says, husband, live with your wife. You know, it's singular. A plural word, but he's speaking collectively to a group of men. Each one of you who is married, you live and you're considerate with your wife. You treat them with respect as the weaker partner. Hit pause on that. That doesn't mean the woman is less valuable. It means typically she is uh, physically weaker. And his heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. See, Peter says, husband, he says, and I love this phrase, be considerate of your wife. Another translation says, live with your wife in an understanding way. It says, go on to say that if you don't live, husband, if you don't live with your wife in a way that shows you understand them, your prayers are going to be hindered. Okay, there is this direct connection. 
between living with your spouse in a way that says, I understand you and what, is, what God is gonna do with your prayers. There's this direct correlation. And this idea of being considerate with them, of living with them in an understanding way means that you live with them according to knowledge is what the Greek phrase means. Be considerate means according to knowledge. And so I'm not just going to be, I wanna challenge you not just to be bored and to be stuck. I want you to live with your spouse in a way that says, I understand them, I know them. I don't just know them cognitively, I understand them. I understand the thoughts running through your, their heads. And by, by the way, this goes both ways. Wife, live with your husband in a way that shows that you understand them according to knowledge. Okay, so I'm gonna study Kristen that even though we've been married 21 years, I am a PhD in Christianology. I'm gonna study her, I'm gonna know her, I'm gonna ask her questions, I'm going to pursue her. Okay, Valentine's Day is, is two days away. I'm gonna do whatever Kristen wants to do for Valentine's Day. I'm gonna pursue her in a way that says, I know and understand her. We're gonna ask questions, we're gonna pursue each other, we're gonna date each other. We got to have a, a little fun weekend away here in Dripping Springs. First time here, we have loved it. It's a great town. Thank you for having us and thanks for being a great town. And so like we've had fun together. We've had we've went great coffee and great meals and time with friends. It's been a really fun weekend. We've gotten like, I know what she likes. I'm gonna keep doing the things that she likes. Okay, I'm gonna put her needs first. I'm going to study her. And she does the same with me. The blind spot that we need to deal with is the blind spot of boredom and complacency. We just get stuck. And the way that we do this, the solution to the blind spot is to continually be a student of your spouse. And so real quick, blind, the three blind spots I discussed. The blind spot of unrealistic expectations. Okay, we're not real, we're not authentic, we don't expect trouble. We need to communicate and work through our expectations continually. Second blind spot is the blind spot of sin and selfishness. The solution, solution to everything is always become more and more like Jesus Christ. Deal with your sin, deal with your selfishness. The third blind spot that leads couples to drift in their marriage is the blind spot of boredom and complacency. And so continually be a learner of your spouse. Know how they're wired, know how they are made. About six years ago, we went through a season that was probably the toughest part of our marriage. The kids were, you know, six years ago, so the kids were 12, 12, can't do the math, nine and seven probably at the time, and we're running all over the place with sports. I wasn't particularly happy in my job. I was unhealthy. Uh, my stepdad had just passed away. It was a really difficult season in our marriage. Probably the hardest one we've had for you know, an extended period of time. And, and over and over, I looked to Kristen as the problem. If Kristen would only do this, if Kristen would only do that, then our marriage would be better, then my life would be better. And a friend challenged me to think through is actually Gary Thomas challenged me to think through, she's not the problem. Maybe there's something that you're missing, Scott. And so challenge me to not keep a list of all the wrongs, but to keep a list of all the rights. And so I, I got this journal for Kristen. It says her name on the front of it. Kristen, 2017, I wrote her a note on Christmas Day, 2016. For the next 365 days, did not miss a day, I wrote a, a little paragraph about my wife, something about her that sticks out, that's unique, that I cherish, that I value. Things that are unique about her. It couldn't just be that she's good looking or that she's a great cook, like things about her character. And so for 365 days, I wrote them down. All different, all unique. Christmas day, 2017, I go and give this to Kristen and I am a blubbering fool. I'm the emotional one in our marriage, okay? I'm the one who cries all the time. And I give this to Kristen and, uh, here, here's the deal. She can't read my handwriting. I could barely read my handwriting, okay? And so the gift isn't, this isn't like something you read cover to cover like a novel. Okay, this is not something that you just sit down, you know, I've got three extra hours. I'm just gonna try to read my husband's chicken scratch. That's not what this is. But the gift that, that I got that she got was a set of new eyes for my wife. Right, for 365 days, I was not focused on what she did wrong. I was focused on what she did right. I was a student of my spouse. I realized how selfless that she was. I realized that some of my unmet expectations were because of my sin. I realized what an amazing gift I had in my spouse. It changed our marriage. 
And so again, she doesn't know what it says in here. I can't remember, but I know it changed the way that I saw Crystal. It dealt with some of my blind spots, and I want to challenge you to do the same. I'm not telling you that your homework is to go keep track of 365 unique things about your spouse. Maybe it is. That's between you and the Lord. My challenge for you would be to change the way that you see your marriage, to deal with the obstacles that you have. If you have friends who are struggling, you have a tool now to be able to encourage them to deal with the blind spots in their marriage. Deal with your sin, with your selfishness. Be a student of your spouse. Live with them in a way that shows that you care about them, that you understand them.